Uh, uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Jeff Yu. Uh, his, um, Jeff is an emergency physician at uh, St. Paul's Hospital and uh, is interested in uh, QI and is trying his best to do patient to make patient care during airway management and resuscitation more effective and safer. He is the project lead for the BC Airway Intervention Registry, which is a QI registry that collects data from all out of the operating room intubations at BGH St. Paul's and Mount St. Joe's. And uh, he's the resuscitation lead for Province Healthcare Emergency Department on Airway. So uh, his talk is, in case of airway management wasn't stressful enough, pearls for airway management and resuscitation during COVID-19 crisis. Thank you very much, Jeff, and I'll hand it over to you now. Thanks so much, Julian. Um, so uh, my name is Jeff Yu. I'm an emergency physician based out of St. Paul's and Mount St. Joseph's Hospital. And over the past seven months, I've been working with a really dedicated team of physicians, nurses, and respiratory therapists um, to develop and optimize um, protocols for intubation and resuscitation in the Providence Healthcare Emergency Department. So it's a real pleasure and honor to be able to speak to you about such a, um, an important topic during this pandemic. Um, the plan for today is to, first of all, review management uh, for patients with severe COVID-19 disease, we'll review PPE guidelines, discuss ways to streamline equipment for intubation, and review team dynamics and optimal use of intubation checklists. Uh, but most importantly, I wanna provide some ideas uh, that you can apply in your own clinical setting to improve patient outcomes uh, who are severely ill with COVID-19 and to keep your members safe. Um, the COVID-19 response work was partially funded by the PHC Physician um, Engagement Fund and supported by the Specialist Services uh, Committee of the PHC and VCH Physician Life Quality Improvement Initiative. So I want to begin by talking about the, the good old days. Uh, so long gone are the days where you could stroll into a patient's bedside with an airway cart that had all the dunked equipment for um, any potential difficult airways that you would encounter right there at your fingertips. When um, doing a pre-intubation pause for a plan was as simple as stating plan A, B, and C. And the days when you could intubate a patient wearing really nothing more than a crop top and walking away uh, with confidence that you weren't going to fall ill or uh, die from a deadly infectious disease. Well, those days are gone, at least for now. Um, and uh, the Great Reset is just such a, a, a great description of what the COVID crisis has been on so many different levels. But um, relating to the emergency medicine uh, and emergency departments, it highlighted a few different uh, things. So first of all, emergency departments were not designed for the pandemic. And um, how St. Paul's Hospital um, faced two main challenges. So first of all, our trauma bay was rendered essentially non-functional because we didn't have negative pressure ventilation. And if paramedics wanted to transport a critically ill patient with COVID-19 into our department, they'd have to roll them down a long hallway where other patients and healthcare workers were before they could be plopped down into an acute care bed or an isolation room. And I know that a lot of other emergency departments dealt with similar challenges, which prompted um, you know, a lot of people to try using these aerosol boxes um, which essentially now are debunked. Um, and St. Paul's took a slightly different approach where we created an outdoor resuscitation zone or an outdoor tent where we would resuscitate and intubate patients, put them on a closed uh, circuit ventilator before transporting them through the department to mitigate the risk of infecting other patients and healthcare workers. Um, since then, we have, we've stopped, essentially stopped using this tent um, uh, because we have a functional trauma bay. The other thing that I highlighted are that intubations um, can now be life-threatening to both the patient and provider, uh, thus highlighting the need for um, really well thought out and safe personal protective equipment. The third thing is that teams and equipment need to be streamlined to fit inside of an isolation room because space and real estate for actually uh, performing resuscitation are now a major issue. So all that being said, essentially what I'm saying is that the COVID-19 crisis has taken um, one of the most stressful uh, aspects of emergency medicine and just made it that much more stressful. And 
thank goodness for the lockdown. I mean, the lockdown um, provided an opportunity while cases were rising the first wave for us to get all of our ducks in a line um, and to develop these protocols to fire PPE um, to get us prepared for a potential surge. And I think when um, the cases started to flatten out, the curve started to flatten, I think a lot of people felt the same way that I did, that we had dodged a massive bullet. Uh, but now that we're entering the second wave, I, uh, why don't we discuss uh, ways that we can essentially improve uh, performance in intubation and resuscitation, how we can keep our team members safe. So just say you have a patient that comes in with um, uh, influenza-like illness, they're hypoxic, they look really unwell. So the things that you're going to want to do right away are, first of all, put them in a negative pressure isolation room and to make sure that all of your team members are donned in appropriate PPE. You'll start regular sepsis management uh, with the caveat that you may want to consider limiting IV fluids uh, by no life-threatening uh, hypotension. And the main reason for that is to kind of decrease the risk of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is often seen in pulmonary COVID-19 disease. The other thing that you'll want to do is titrate oxygen to target a saturation of 88 to 92 percent. You can give dexamethasone six milligrams PO or IV for patients who will require hospital admission or oxygen therapy. And um, the main point from this slide that I really want to hammer home is use your clinical judgment to decide if the patient in requires intubation instead of using an arbitrary FIO2 requirement or um, oxygen flow requirements for these patients. So the things that you'll be looking out for are excessive work breathing, severe respiratory acidosis, shock, altered mental status, multi-organ failure, or if the patient's overall trajectory is going down uh, and they're not responding to supplemental oxygen or high flow nasal cannula like an OptiFlow machine. If you do decide to intubate a patient, um, you wanna take a two-pronged approach. So first of all, you want to optimize your team safety. Uh, by donning PPE before any kind of intervention. You wanna also limit the healthcare workers in the room because of the limited space. And I would really advocate for a three person team inside the room that would include a physician, a nurse and a respiratory therapist. Um, we also would encourage using a runner, someone who is donned in airborne PPE who can uh, shuttle meds and equipment in and out of the room as needed. I would also um, encourage people to avoid using AGMPs or aerosol generating medical procedures um, and apneic oxygenation and ventilation. And if you are ventilating a patient, make sure that you're using a hydrophobic filter so that um, essentially all uh, viral particles will be captured um, and not being uh, be disseminated inside the room. The other prong of intubation is to optimize team performance. So early controlled intubation will always be preferred over a crash intubation on a rapidly deteriorating patient. You wanna use your most experienced airway operator to increase your chance of first pass success and minimize the amount of equipment in the room. Video laryngoscopy is going to be preferred over direct uh, laryngoscopy for two main reasons. So first of all, it's gonna give you your best chance of obtaining a good view of the larynx. And secondly, it'll actually, um, allow for a further distance from the airway operator's face from the patient's airway. These are the BCCDC guidelines for intubation PPE. So on the left column is um, in green is the standard PPE items. In other words, the bare minimum requirements to keep your team members safe when performing an intubation. That includes an N95, goggles, a gown, and gloves. Middle column in yellow are non-standard items that you could consider using in your emergency departments if uh, it's endorsed by your local IPAC, if there's an adequate supply, and uh, if your team members have had ample opportunity to, um, to train using these items and to be able to safely on and doff these items in a real life scenario. The third column in red are items that are not recommended either because they don't add any real benefit or um, they actually expose your team members to harm. So this is a, a picture depiction of uh, our team members wearing the standard PPE with the exception that we're wearing surgical masks instead of, instead of N95s for the simulation. One of the, I guess, um, 
uh, concerns with using standard PPE that's been highlighted in a few articles that have been published in the recent past are that aerosols that are generated from um, intubation or uh, from a patient that's actively coughing um, can actually contaminate any um, exposed areas of skin, most notably the anterior neck, forehead, and hair, and can also uh, contaminate, grossly contaminate the exterior surfaces of the, the goggles and um, mask. So what we've opted to do in Providence Healthcare's emergency departments is to use a non-standard or enhanced PPE, which includes Tyvek coveralls, which are um, fluid impermeable, um, as well as a face shield over top goggles, N95, and double gloves. So a surgical glove with high cuffs that kind of wraps over the Tyvek uh, sleeve, and then nitro gloves on top of that. So essentially, we're providing fluid uh, impermeable coverage from head to toe for all uh, providers that are involved in an intubation. And what we found is that when we run our team members through simulation, although there's gross contamination of the entire uh, Tyvek coverall, um, and usually we're seeing gross contamination of all areas, including kind of like the areas of the neck and um, the face shield, and even on the posterior surfaces on a lot of our teammates. But the reassuring thing is that after um, all of our team members have doffed, not one of our team members has had any evidence of contamination to their skin, either from the procedure of intubation or the doffing process. Regardless of what PPE your clinical setting decides to use for these uh, AGMPs, I would highly advocate for using a donning and doffing poster or some kind of stepwise approach that your team members can use uh, to make sure that they're doing it in a safe manner. These are the examples of the donning and doffing posters that we use in Providence Healthcare's emergency departments. Jeff, you have about two minutes. Oh, wow, just two minutes. Just over. Okay, um, well, airway carts are not recommended. We've created these airway bins um, uh, and I'll show you how they work. So essentially they're standardized Tupperware bins that have a preloaded uh, save a tray that have all of our um, standard airway equipment and the rest of the bin has all adjunctive equipment that you would need for a difficult airway. So essentially, if you needed to perform an intubation on um, a rapidly deteriorating patient, all you would need to do is grab the save day tray, run into the room, and you would have everything that you need to perform an intubation. Um, we've switched to using handheld uh, video laryngoscopes because it's so easy to clean after use. All you need is a chem wipe to wipe it down, dispose the disposable blades, and you're ready for the next intubation. Um, I'll skip over that. Uh, we've kind of adapted the BC airway checklist to a stepwise approach checklist. And the, I'll demonstrate its use over here just quickly. Um, so essentially, the, you're going to want to go in with your team. First of all, define roles in non PPE. So, doctor, respiratory therapist, and nurse, and one additional runner that's donned in airborne PPE outside of the room to show air uh, equipment in and out. You don as a team using the Don poster. And then once, um, once your team is fully donned, you then move on to the next step, which is preparing equipment. And all of your team members will have a distinct uh, role. So the nurse prepares meds, RT prepares equipment, the doctor coordinates that and checks the room to make sure that there's all the equipment is there inside the room. And then you would enter the room and then uh, do the third step, which is a pre-intubation pause. So make sure that your equipment is ready to go make sure the patient is prepared and um, uh, looking for any signs of difficult airway and then review your plan. And once that is done, you would proceed to intubate the patient. Um, over here, again, I'm using the McGrath video laryngoscope. Um, once the patient is intubated, you would then move on to the post-intubation management or step four of the uh, intubation checklist. And um, uh, there are a few steps in the post-intubation uh, phase. So two management, your vent settings, your meds and sedation, and then the equipment. Uh, and then you would proceed to doff using the doffing poster and supervision from each of your teammates. So to summarize, healthcare worker safety will take priority during intubation. Um, donning and doffing PPE is very complicated. So again, I would advocate for using donning and doffing posters to make sure that your team members are uh, doing this in a safe manner. 
consider using a streamlined intubation box um, as I've kind of shown you here and use a stepwise approach for intubation and consider using a checklist. And most importantly, just support each other and practice as a team. You know, this is a really uh, stressful time for everyone and we're all in this together. So um, yeah, it's, it's really important to know that we're, uh, we're doing this all together. I really want to acknowledge all the following people for their involvement um, in the COVID-19 response uh, in terms of airway management and resuscitation. None of this work would have been possible without uh, the contributions from these people. Thanks so much, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was amazing. Um, and thank you for your leadership in all of this uh, airway and during these, uh, these challenging times. But uh, a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, I see one here. I'm going to pump it. Um, in the setting of uh, suspected fluid overload and sepsis, what initial fluid uh, bolus do you recommend? So uh, I think that really depends on the patient's hemodynamic status. So if the patient is um, severely hypotensive and their MAP is less than 65, I would, I think it's fair to at least give them a bolus of 500 cc's initially. Um, you know, uh, if you if the patient requires more fluid than one liter, uh, I think that's the point that you should begin considering uh, vasopressors like norepinephrine um, uh, added on. Great, thank you. And can you talk about uh, how you get learners involved in intubations in a safe manner, please? Yeah, so this is um, an issue that we've kind of been struggling with um, because obviously learners uh, like uh, our senior residents need to gain experience with airway ma management and they have a limited time to do so. Um, so I, I think if it's, uh, if the patient looks like they're not uh, imminently crashing and it looks like a pretty standard airway, I think it's fair to get your learners involved, um, provided that they have gone through training to don, safely don and doff PPE and they know how to use these checklists and work as a team. Um, but yeah, that's something that you'll have to discuss as a department of, I, I guess, like how much risk that you're uh, willing to take. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, can you clarify whether you are using this process universally or just in certain highly suspected patients? Like what is your what is your trigger for protected intubation? We are using these precautions universally. And the reason for that is because um, we really don't know who is infected and who is not. I mean, um, if you remember back to the spring, New York City was seeing patients who were, came in with trauma who had no symptoms of COVID-19. And after they received you know, CT pan scans, um, they had signs of COVID pulmonary disease. And this is something um, that we need to be cautious of. We, we need to make sure that none of our team members are getting infected. And we've really taken the approach that one infected team member is one too many. Great, thank you. Uh, a couple that are very similar. Um, how I'll just sort of try and bring them together. How did you uh, make your non-negative pressure trauma rooms acceptable for COVID uh, safe intubation, resuscitation? And, and then how did you make them functional again um, in the setting of trying to make them negative pressure? Can you talk a little bit about what the changes you had to make to the resuscitation rooms? So we hired um, an external contractor to um, essentially punch holes in the wall of the trauma bay and feed uh, large pipes that suck out air from the um, air from the trauma bay and take it out onto the roof of the hospital. Um, and uh, we had an air engineer to actually design the airflow so that it would take air from um, essentially the sliding doors of the trauma bay and take it towards those uh, external vents. Um, so uh, essentially that's how, in simple terms, that's really how we created it into a negative pressure space. Great, thank you. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to cut it off there. Um, please, uh, we'll be addressing these questions on the archive list. Uh, so thank you again, Jeff. Uh, this is an excellent talk and a very important talk. And again, thank you for your leadership on this. It was amazing.